It's the biggest market scandal of 2022, a scandal that eclipses last year's GameStop saga and further goes to show that in financial markets, the big guys always win. Today, I'm going to tell you about how one of the biggest short squeezes in recent memory led to an exchange actually cancelling trades and bailing out bankers and billionaires. This is a video you don't want to miss. Before this video gets underway, I need to make a few things clear, okay? If financial advice is what you came here for, then I must regretfully show you the door. Education and entertainment are what I dispense, so contact a financial advisor if your finances are a mess. To those who haven't seen my face before, my name is Guy and crypto is the thing that I adore. The Coin Bureau is home to the greatest crypto content in the Milky Way. We cover all aspects of the cryptoverse every single day. If the thought of such stuff makes your heart sore, tap subscribe and the bell to ensure you get more. As you know, the world of finance has many facets and sometimes I cover more than just digital assets. Today, I'll be talking all about nickel and I'm curious to see if it tickles your pickle. So with that image burned in your brain, let's hear about the time the metal market went insane. A few weeks ago, on the 8th of March, the nickel market broke. That's right, the market for a commodity that's used in everything from batteries to jet engines to coins ceased operating. That's because on that day, the nickel market began one of the most mind-boggling rallies that the commodity had ever seen. One that was being driven by an epic short squeeze. Now, for those who don't know, a short squeeze is when there are market participants who have sold an asset short in the hope that it falls in price. However, if the price moves against them, they need to go into the market and buy the asset to cover their short position. This then creates a situation in which the actions of those who are short exacerbates the moves, a la the GameStop short squeeze last year. Except, of course, nickel is not a meme stock. It's a commodity which is the lifeblood of many industries. A relatively non-volatile commodity that has traded between about $10,000 and $20,000 per tonne for much of the past decade. And unlike most stocks, base metals are traded in a unique way. A great deal of this trading activity takes place on the London Metal Exchange, or LME, which is in fact one of the few places where trades are done with an open outcry. Anywho, back to the story. The short squeeze had actually begun the day before, on the 7th of March, when the price of nickel rallied by over 66% to reach a level of $48,000. This is something that had the entire nickel industry in crisis. There were worries about the implications that this could have on the solvency of those with margin calls. On top of that, you also had the fact that producers now had a cost of production that was up by over 60% in a day. Talk about inflation. On that Monday evening, the LME held a special committee meeting of metal and legal experts who are supposed to make decisions about what to do with the market. These people then decided on that call that they would allow the market to continue trading the next day. I'll leave a link to this story in Bloomberg for you. It gives a pretty chilling account of what happened. The market duly opened at 1am for the Asia session. Things initially appeared to be going OK, with prices hovering around 50k. The CEO of the LME thought that was a good enough sign to perhaps get some shut-eye. However, at 5.30 a.m., he got a frantic call. Markets were going haywire, and it wasn't just nickel. That same committee held a call that morning at 6 as they scrambled to see what they could do about the market. Prices were now floating above 80k and were hurtling towards the 100k level. There was legitimate fear in the market as those who had sold short anticipated a wipeout. Not only that, but there appeared to be one really, really large short seller in particular who had placed all his trades through numerous brokers. These brokers now had to pay margin, even though their client had not posted margin to them. According to John Browning of Bands Financial, quote, you could feel the damage and you knew companies were fighting for their existence. It was at this time that the LME decided to call it quits and suspend trading at 8.15 just before in-person trading got underway at the LME. 
The price was stopped at 80K, which was a level that the LME said would have seen four or five member brokers fail. According to the CEO of the LME, the exchange had, quote, serious concerns about the ability of market participants to meet their resulting margin calls, raising the significant risk of multiple defaults. It was then that the LME took one of the most unprecedented moves in modern market history. They decided to cancel all of the trades that had taken place that morning. That is, essentially roll back over 5,000 trades with a total value of over $3.9 billion. The LME as an exchange decided to rewind the market to the close of the previous Monday when prices were sitting at just above 48K. Now, the implications of this move cannot be understated. However, before we get into that, we have to rewind a little. In Chinese commodity circles, his name is Big Shot. Zhang Guangda is the billionaire founder of a company called Qingshan Holding Group. To say that he has influence over the market is perhaps the understatement of the year. In fact, Qingshan Holding is one of the world's largest nickel and stainless steel producers. In the nickel market, there is no one who has more clout. It wasn't always that way, though. Zhang got his first job fixing machinery at a state-run fishery. During the 1980s, he took advantage of China's economic reforms to become a businessman. His first venture was a business that made windows and doors for state-owned car makers. In the 1990s, he decided to pivot into the stainless steel industry to make the most of the Chinese industrial boom. According to a metals analyst in this piece from the FT, quote, in the mid-2000s, they were a small stainless steel producer in Wenzhou. Last year, they were responsible for almost a quarter of global production. But it was the moves that Zhang made in the nickel market that were perhaps the most notable. Through a number of technological innovations, he upended how the metal was made. This was also helped by some large-scale bets that he made while investing in Indonesia. This transformed Qingshan into the largest nickel producer in the world. Now, given that he holds so much heft in the supply of nickel, he can have a huge impact on prices, and he's used this to his own advantage. For example, in 2019, Zhang teamed up with those fine folks over at JP Morgan in order to push up the price of nickel. Essentially, they bought anywhere between 30 and 80,000 tons of the stuff. They also worked to reduce the supplies of nickel that were stored in the LME warehouses, the biggest fall in over 40 years. Of course, this had a sizable impact on price, which helped both Zhang and JPM to profit handsomely. According to Bloomberg, in 2019, JP Morgan made $100 million trading nickel. Funny how the world works sometimes, eh? Then, almost exactly a year ago, Zhang helped drive down the price of nickel by unveiling a new production method that made it cheaper, especially when used in electric vehicles. This led to a collapse in price. Now, one can be sure that as a producer of it, he doubtless had large short contracts out on the LME. So the point is that Zhang has shown that he is a massive mover in the nickel market, a big shot whale who can drive prices. But according to one nickel expert, quote, the guy has an Achilles heel, which you often see among successful people in China. He loves to punt. And punting is exactly what he decided to do earlier this year. Like most commodities, nickel has been through a crazy past two years. Firstly, during the pandemic lockdowns of early 2020, the price fell, given the collapse in demand for end products which used it. However, when those lockdowns started lifting and economies rebounded, so too did demand for all items, not least of which was electric vehicles. For example, in 2021, we saw a 113% increase in total electric vehicle capacity, far outpacing demand for normal cars. This EV revolution led many market participants to take a more bullish view on the metal. Hedge funds started to strategically take long positions on the metal towards the end of last year and earlier this year. Well, that was all people except the big shot himself. He basically took the view that nickel was inherently overpriced above 20k. That's because he knew that he could produce the metal in Indonesia for about half that. He was also of the view that the short-term rally we were seeing 
was not sustainable and was destined to come back down to levels closer to the cost he was able to produce nickel for in Indonesia. So, towards the end of last year, he started to take on really large short positions in the nickel market, and in a big way. By some estimates, his overall short position was in the region of 150,000 tons. Now, this was opened in two ways. Firstly, there was a short of around 30,000 tons that was opened directly at the LME. This was through a network of brokers who made the trades for Qingsan on the exchange. However, a far larger component of the short position was opened up via a network of banks and brokers through bilateral short agreements, OTC or over-the-counter deals. You might be able to guess which one of the big banks was counterparty to that trade. That's right, good old JP Morgan. Now, according to sources, about 50,000 tonnes of the short position was held in OTC trades with the bank. Now, part of the issue with all these positions, especially those that were off the exchange, was that it was hard to determine exactly who was exposed. The LME had very little oversight into the systemic risks posed by these trades, as they were entered into in a relatively opaque way. This meant that no one could see exactly how much risk or leverage was built up in the system, the exact extent of just how large margin calls could be and how likely a short squeeze really was. It's also worth pointing out that the nickel that Xing San produced was not the refined nickel that's required to settle contracts on the LME. It produced what is called nickel pig iron, which is a low-grade ferro-nickel which would need to be refined. So, if Zhang was caught in a short squeeze, that would mean Qing San would have to settle the contracts in cash and could not deliver the short-sold nickel. So, the scene was set. The powder keg was primed and all you needed was a spark. And that came soon enough. While nickel prices were already moving up in the early part of the year, Zhang was still of the opinion that he could keep prices down in the physical market. This was despite the battle that he was having with a mysterious buyer who was stockpiling nickel at the LME. However, things took a dramatic turn on the 24th of February when Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. While the conflict itself may have led to some volatility around the commodities markets, it was the resulting sanctions that really dialed the market disruption up to 11. I've talked about this in much greater detail in my video about the impact of sanctions, which I've linked to in the top right for you to come back to later. As it pertains to the nickel market, though, Russia is the world's third largest producer and is the largest exporter of the refined metal, the type that's used to settle contracts at the LME. And although Russian nickel was not officially sanctioned, buyers in the US and Europe decided to find alternative sources out of fear that this could eventually happen. Moreover, trading Russian metal at such a time would not have been a good look. Anyways, this move to source alternative supplies of nickel around the world led to a massive rally in the price of the metal. This was the exogenous shock that started one of the most epic short squeezes the commodities market has ever seen. On the 7th of March, the short squeeze started taking effect. Those who were short had to now go into the market and physically buy the metal. Their buying now pushed the price up even further. Moreover, many of the brokers who had executed the shorts for large players like Ching Sang now had to hedge their exposure by going long on opposing contracts, even more buying pressure. And on top of this, you had a number of hedge funds who were in the long position, smelt blood in the water, and kept buying the contracts. So on that Monday, the price rallied from 30k to more than 50k. This would have been the ideal time for the LME to suspend trading, to allow the markets to digest the moves and line up banks or credit lines in order to meet these margin calls. Unfortunately, unlike many other exchanges that have automated circuit breakers in place, no such thing existed at the LME. Therefore, LME management had to make that decision separately. This is exactly what the special committee meeting was about. However, it seems that in that Monday evening meeting, they did not make the right call. They allowed trading to commence the next day, which is when it all went really pear-shaped. That, of course, prompted the unprecedented decision to roll back the trades that had taken place on the morning of the 8th. And to say that there was blowback is putting it mildly. 
By allowing the market to continue trading on the 8th of March, the LME allowed market participants to engage in trades. Trades which were at their core a willing transaction between a buyer and a seller. An arm's length transaction with full information. Some long hedge funds had booked millions in profit on that day as they closed out these positions. On top of that, there were some traders who entered relative value trades where they attempted to profit in price discrepancy between two different commodities. Now, these are highly structured trades that require all trades to go through in order to make sure they're appropriately hedged. However, by stopping and rewinding trading, not only did the LME snipe the profits of the longs, but they also threw these relative value trades into chaos, i.e. by only cancelling the nickel trades, these funds may have had full exposure to another commodity unhedged, something they may not have wanted. But it's the fact that this move by the LME even happened at all that had so many people up in arms. Many thought they chose winners and losers and that they may have stepped in to help the short side. Many banks and hedge funds were livid. Some said they would initiate lawsuits. Others promised that they would never trade on the LME again. Many also made their displeasure known publicly. Mark Thompson, an ex-trader from Trafigura and Apollo, tweeted, quote, For the LME to cancel nickel trades between willing buyers and sellers is unforgivable. Unforgivable. Clifford Asness of AQR Capital Management was particularly vocal about the cancelled trades. In a tweet, he said, quote, Stealing money from market participants trading in good faith and giving it to Chinese nickel producers and their banks who could have absorbed the losses. Yeah, integrity. The CEO of the LME defended cancelling the trades and again came back to the point around market integrity. There were fears about the contagion effects if there was indeed a collapse of LME brokers who could not meet margin calls. However, it's hard not to get suspicious of the intentions when you know exactly who was on the opposite side of that trade. JP Morgan and Zhang, market participants who had used their clout in the past in order to move markets and profit, big time. Beyond that, there's a twist here. That's the fact that the LME is owned by Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited. That raises questions about whether the LME could have felt some outside pressure to bail out the metals tycoon on the opposite side of the trade. The LME denies this, of course, and claims that it received no outside pressure whatsoever. Perhaps we'll never really get to the bottom of it. But the whole story does sound fishy. And by that, I mean it reeks of six-day-old rotting sushi that could put you off seafood for life. Anywho, in the days after the market was closed, the LME said that it was working with market participants to see if it could offset longs and shorts before things reopened. However, the big shot himself told his banks and brokers that he did not intend to reduce his short position and he managed to work out a deal with JP Morgan. When the LME did eventually reopen the nickel market, things were still incredibly volatile. Prices seemed to have settled around the 32k range, still higher than at the beginning of the year, but far off the highs we saw in the squeeze. And more recently, it was disclosed that Zhang had covered part of his short position at these lower prices. So, at least for now, it appears as if the shorts and their banker backers have been saved. Now, I wanted to finish this off with a few closing thoughts. I guess the main thing that I take away from this is the fact that despite how advanced the global financial markets are supposed to be, it's mind-blowing how you could have a short squeeze of this magnitude. This wasn't a meme coin. It was not a video game retailer. It was a commodity that's the lifeblood of many industries. How on earth could someone build up such a large position? And how could this be done without any sort of oversight from the regulators, or at the very least, the exchange operator? This also raises the broader issue of manipulation in the global commodities markets. Is it fair that a whale in the physical commodities market, who can very easily move prices, is able to take side bets on those prices which he is able to move? Sure, there's nothing wrong as a producer when you're trying to hedge a position. But where is the line between hedging and punting drawn. You also have to ask how much of this was made possible by the usual suspects. Banks like JP Morgan had previously bankrolled these trades, and in 2019 it had made bank to the tune of $100 million from doing so. 
Through its Byzantine structuring of these nickel OTC contracts, it helped to create a market that was overleveraged and unstable. Not that we haven't seen that happen in other markets, have we? But what I think is perhaps most shocking about this story is what happened after the short squeeze. I have never heard of a situation in which an entire morning session of trading was just rolled back and invalidated. Even during the GameStop short squeeze last year, retail traders were only prevented from buying more stock, scandalous as that was. You didn't, though, have a reversal of an entire day's trading. Reversing market trades between two willing participants goes against the bedrock principles of capitalism. And moreover, in capitalism, there are winners and losers in a trade. It's not the exchange's job to decide who those winners and losers are. It's the markets. Perhaps the LME does have a point about the risks to the broader commodity markets. But that still doesn't explain the fact that it decided to roll the dice and open the market for trading in the middle of the short squeeze. One also has to wonder that if prices instead of rallying collapsed, would the LME also have stopped and reversed trading in those circumstances? Those hedge funds and banks that were on the long side of the trade have a right to be livid. I would be too. Then, of course, there are those suspicions around what actually went on behind the scenes when the decision to reverse the trades was taken. Short of any hard evidence, we have to take them at their word. An uncontrollable situation that no one expected on a Monday evening. My only hope is that a lesson has been learned from this experience. That rules and protocols are put in place to protect market integrity and punish abuse. Perhaps it's a false hope given everything that's happened since 2008. However, I for one would prefer to see the glasses half full. And that's all for my video today, folks, but I'm dying for some of your feedback. What do you think about this episode? Was there more going on behind the scenes? I'd love to know in the comments below. If you don't have a comment, that's cool. You may also be interested in my socials page. This is the page where I share exclusive content that you're not getting here. These all have blue ticks and they include my Telegram Insider channel for daily market analysis and thoughts, my Twitter for announcements and the occasional shitpost, and TikTok for behind-the-scenes views and memes, and lastly, but definitely not leastly, my weekly newsletter. It's here that I share my crypto tips as well as a breakdown of my personal portfolio. It comes only once weekly and with a spam-free guarantee. The links to all of those are in my socials page below. Oh yes, and if you're looking for some of the best deals in the crypto space, then you have come to the right place. My deals page below has exclusive discounts and promos that you won't find anywhere else. So be sure to go down there for all that good stuff. Finally, if you found this video helpful, slap a like on it. Subscribe and ping that bell as well to make sure you never miss another one. Time's up for this guy, but I'll be seeing you guys very soon. My name is Guy and you have been watching The Coin Bureau. Thank <laughs> you.